come in our Bibles then to First Peter and uh, the opening verse uh, of this uh, wonderful uh, letter. And uh, there is a, an unusual feature of studies on, on First Peter that it's generally been neglected by the Christian church for long periods of time. Until fairly recently, it was quite hard to find a substantial commentary on First and Second Peter. The church has generally adored the, writings, adored the writings of Paul, valued the writings of John and the Gospels, but the church has generally ignored the writings of Peter. And this is quite surprising because in the debate about what books should be in the Bible, one of the reasons why First and Second Peter should not be there that was given was that it's too much like Paul, and yet the church was adoring Paul's writing. So there was a, an inconsistency there in the argument, if you can understand uh, that argument. The neglect of Peter and the preference for the writings of Paul and John and the Gospels may still be a characteristic of the Christian church today. But it's not of everybody in this congregation, as I've already indicated, and someone very kindly sent me a text when hearing of our studies in First Peter saying that I'm really looking forward to this. And so perhaps it's to counter this focus on Paul and John that we're looking at First Peter, but more importantly, to come to First Peter realizing that it's a brilliant summary of the Christian life and what it means to be a Christian. This first Peter, uh, book of Peter has been described as a manual of Christianity. To master first Peter is to master what Christianity is. It teases out for us what a Christian is and how a Christian should live. We'll see in the opening chapters it describes what a Christian is and we'll identify seven aspects of a Christian in this first chapter. In the second chapter, we'll see three metaphors of what a Christian is. The Christian in relation to himself, herself. In the second chapter, it goes on to describe the Christian in relation to others, in relation to society, in relation in the, uh, to, to the, the, the master or the employer in the workplace, in relation to his or her spouse. The Christian in relation to others. And then in the fourth chapter, we'll come to see the Christian in relation to the church. We see this then as a manual of the Christian life. What the Christian is and how the Christian lives will be teased out for us fascinatingly, interestingly, in this first book of Peter. So introducing this book uh, today, and, and it's probably helpful to have an introduction uh, to, to, to any new book that we're beginning studying. We're not looking at the, the boring dates, location, structure, writer, reader, although that will be in our sermon in, in some measure. All of that's in your Reformation Study Bible introductions, uh, which you can read perhaps later on, or the excellent commentary by Ed Clowney on, on First Peter. Rather, we want to come as we close this year, 2023, only three weeks left. Perhaps you are beginning to look back on the year and, and what it's held for you, to reflect on some of the successes or disappointments that you've experienced. And perhaps our sermon today will, will help you to reflect on the past year because there's seven principles in this first verse which we can use to reflect on our life at this time and plan for 20. 24. Firstly, let Jesus be central to our lives. Let Jesus be central to our lives. Babylon was the place of writing this letter. Chapter 5, verse 13 states, she who is at Babylon sends you greetings. For a number of reasons, I think Babylon in 513 is a code for the city of Rome. First, Babylon and other New Testament chapters is identified with the city of Rome. Revelation 16, 17, and 18, Babylon is code for Rome. Second, there's historical evidence that Peter was in Rome at the end of his life. Tertullian in 203 AD, a church father, asserts that Peter was 
in Rome. The story in Eusebius in 325 AD states that Peter, at the end, came to Rome and was crucified. Thirdly, Babylon in Mesopotamia in the first century was a small and obscure place. Strabo, the first century geographer and philosopher, wrote in 19 AD, the great city is a great desert. So why would Peter bother to mention Babylon when it was a city that was decimated? And fourthly, there's no evidence that Peter was ever in Mesopotamia or that there was churches there. And so when we read Babylon in 513, we're to think Rome. Here is Peter writing from Rome to these churches in Turkey. It was the center of world power and of opposition to God and to God's people. But it was from that city, the heart of the empire, the place of power at that time, that the apostle Peter writes this letter. What a magnificent city Rome was. It was spellbinding. It's magnificent today. It's well worth doing a city break to the city of Rome if you're thinking of such a thing. But we only see traces today of its former glory. A man from Galilee like Peter, the city of Rome, was overwhelming, tantalizing, just incredible. Today we can go and we can see the straight streets and we can imagine the charioteers racing down the straight streets in Rome with those high buildings on, on either side and people hanging out and cheering on their heroes from, from those uh, windows up on the high buildings. We can see the streets. But Peter saw the chariots and the racing and heard the noise in the city of Rome in its height in the first century. We see the remnants of the Colosseum and we can use our imagination to, to picture that the crowds that were there and the, the games that were going on in the center of that stadium. But Peter could visit the Colosseum, could watch the games, could hear the crowds with his very ears. What a magnificent place Rome was in the first century. Everyone wanted to go there, be part of it. But Peter wasn't spending his time sightseeing. He wasn't distracted from his calling. Roman history or archaeology did not take over his life at this point. Christ remained king of his heart and love of the church remained prominent in his soul. Jesus was central to his life. And all of us are surrounded with distractions. Teenagers on average spend 4.8 hours a day on social media and perhaps that's a distraction for some teenagers. Older people who avoid social media, they spend hours reading the newspaper or watching their programs. All of us, like the Apostle Peter, are surrounded by tantalizing, interesting, gripping things which will sap away our time. Well, let's, like Peter, have Jesus at the center of our life. What dominates our thoughts at this time? Our life, our time. Is it the new bathroom we're putting in? Changing the car in the new year, the summer holiday that we're planning, the festive shopping that we're engaged in, have these things taken over in our life? We need to study First Peter. He barely mentions himself. Or oh, this magnificent city. The book is all about Jesus. And what made him like that? Peter had seen, he tells us, the greatest sight. 5 verse 1, he was a witness of the sufferings of Jesus. And that sight of Jesus hung between heaven and earth, bearing away the sin of the world, his sins included, transformed the man and placed Jesus at the center of his life. Secondly, let us serve Jesus better. 
chief objection to Petrine authorship is the good quality of the Greek in this letter. First Peter is written in excellent Greek. The letter exhibits an author with a good vocabulary and an ability to effectively use a wide variety of verbal forms and sentence structures. And this leads one writer, Beer, to write of Peter that he should that he should ever become a master of Greek prose is simply unthinkable. We disagree with Beer, of course. We recall the amazement of the Sanhedrin at Peter's linguistic ability in Acts 4.13. Though he was unlearned, that is, never been at the rabbinic schools, he was eloquent and powerful in his oration. Greek was commonly spoken in Israel. A plaque in the temple in Jerusalem unearthed in the 19th century warned Jews not to go beyond that point and it was written in Greek. Inscriptions found on the walls of the synagogue in Ophel Hill in the south of the temple of Jerusalem were also written in Greek. Cities around the Sea of Galilee spoke the Greek language. Here's Peter called to be an apostle to the Jews in the Greek-speaking world. And he's developed his Greek to serve God, to fulfill his calling. He's worked hard at it. He was conscientious. He was precise. He was exact. He was polished in his writing here. The colloquialisms of his time in Galilee, the slang, the mistakes were ironed out. And he writes here, inspired by the Spirit, of course, with wonderful language. Let us serve Jesus better. Joseph Conrad, he lived 1857 to 1924. His first language was Polish. His second language was French. And his third language was English. He only started learning English at the age of 21. But one of his novels called Lord Jim, published in 1900, is considered a classic in the English language. Here is Peter, a fisherman from the backwaters of Israel. He works at his language. He refines it. He polishes it so that he can serve Jesus better, so that the listeners are not put off from the message by his grammatical mistakes. Let us also then serve Jesus better by developing our gifts. Whatever our calling in the service of Jesus is, let us aim as we end this year and start a new year for excellence. As a minister, as an elder, as a deacon, as a teacher, as a father leading in family worship, as a mother listening to a child's joys and sorrows, as a teacher in your classroom, as a pupil in your school, as a church member in this congregation. Let us all aim to serve Jesus better. Thirdly, let us consider others' practical needs. This letter is addressed to Christians in modern-day Turkey. There are five names in verse 1 and four regions in the Roman Empire mentioned in this opening verse. In the north, Bithynian Pontus. In the west, Asia. In the east, Galatia. In the south, Cappadocia. And as Peter pens the five names... He is thinking, not randomly, but he is thinking graciously and kindly of the best route for the messenger taking his letter, probably Silas. Peter is helping him, setting out the course to use the easiest paths and the best trade routes where he will facilitate, where he will get the best transportation to reach these five destinations. He's not leaving Silas to find his own way. Starting in the north in Pontus, going south to Galatia, east to Cappadocia, west to Asia, and back to Bithynia in the north was the best, the most efficient route that any traveler could go. There'd be no wasted steps. The carrier would be able to utilize the best trade routes There's no confused haphazard list here. The journey would be long and hazardous, but Peter shows care for the letter carrier by setting out the best route to be followed. 
Many of you weren't privy to this last Sabbath morning before communion, but I, I'll give you this insight into the workings of session. At the end of our session gathering, in the little room at the front there, the clerk of session handed out to each of the elders a slip of paper. And on this slip of paper was printed and highlighted in yellow highlighting their duties at communion. The role of each elder was clear. Be no wasted moments for them or steps. No confusion around the duties of communion. It was thoughtfully and orderly done. And let us consider others' practical needs. Can we be caring for others when we are asking them to do something? Will we aim to make their load a little easier, as Peter's doing here? They will do the job, but we will help them in doing it. It's possible that Peter had never been to these places, and thus it's even more significant that he bothers to research the areas and find someone who knew the places and identify the best route for Silas to carry this letter around. It is easy for us to pass the book to pass it with a laugh and a smile. Oh, you'll do that, you'll do that. You, you, you'll be good at doing that. But if we are passing the book, let us help the one that we're passing the book to. Peter is not going to take this letter to these five places. His feet are not going to get blistered. His teeth are not going to chatter in the cold weather. His face is not going to be battered with the rain. His heart is not going to be pounding at the howl of wolves. Someone else will do this delivery job while he remains in Rome, but he will do his best to help that person. When a young person is going to university to study in Belfast or in Edinburgh, I immediately think of a book that I could give them that will help them and encourage them, as I just done with Francis here, uh, on their way. Maybe like Peter here, I should, include a, I should include a map in the book of the best Wi-Fi cafes in Belfast or Edinburgh and the best coffee bistros that the student could go along and sit in in the cold weather. Let us care for others' practical needs. Fourthly, the world is not our home. The world is not our home. See how the readers are described in verse 1 to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion. The word dispersion is a strange word to us, but it was familiar to the New Testament readers. It's used in the Old Testament, and we read of it in Deuteronomy 28, of the Jews being scattered throughout the world outside of Israel, where many Jewish communities existed. At the time of writing in the first century, about one million Jews were living in Israel but 2.4 million Jews were off the dispersion. They were scattered throughout the empire. But those outside of the land of Israel, scattered right across the world, considered their home to be Israel. And they desired to return there. Thus, they were considered as strangers, as pilgrims, as aliens in other lands because their real home was the land of Israel. And Peter takes up that idea of having one home, but living away from that home, as he does many times, and applies this to the true Jews in the Old Testament and the New Testament church. Christians now, believers now, we're not at home. Newton Arts, Northern Ireland, is not our real, ultimate home. Our real and ultimate home is heaven through Jesus Christ. Living in this world, we are aliens. We are strangers. Our true home is, is in heaven. We too are like exiles of the dispersion. In 1 Peter, Peter talks about heaven in the most amazing way. He talks about our home, see verse 4, an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading in heaven for you. In chapter 1 of his second letter, he has the same idea. 
when he likens his body and he feels he's coming to the end of his life, he says it's like taking down a tent and moving on. The tent is temporary dwelling. But he's, he's going to move home to heaven, his permanent dwelling. Do you notice that people outside their country are more vocal about their country than if they were in it? I don't know if it's the same about Venezuela, uh, that you talk more about Venezuela when you're here uh, than when you're there. But, but I probably do about Scotland. I'm always on about Scotland. And in fact, one time I got rebuked by a church member, uh, no, no one here. I, I was going on about Colin Montgomery, the, the Scottish golfer, and, and they were saying, well, why do you not mention Rory McIlroy, you know, the Northern Ireland golfer? And maybe that is a feature of people outside of their country. They talk more about the place that they consider to be their origin and their home than the country that they're living in. And so you and I should be really passionate about heaven, our true home, of the things of the kingdom, and about earth. What one of the brilliant experiences I have during the week is, 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 is often picking up my kids from school and I meet some of the members from the church uh, down there and it's thrilling for me. If I mention some good experience I've had out visiting or, or some person I've had a conversation with and I, and I share this with a church member at the school gate, how excited they are. That's their deep interest. That's their main interest. That's their chief concern. Heaven, the kingdom of God. And for all of us, and for Peter here, he's reminding us we're pilgrims, we're exiles, we're off the dispersion, we're away from our home. But our real home is heaven. Does some of you look back on 2023, you remember believing loved ones who are no longer here with you and with us. But they've gone home. It's not them who are in exile. It's us who are in exile. And we, like them, are on this wonderful journey by the grace of Christ that we are heading for our home. Fifthly, you can have a ministry beyond this congregation. Peter was in Babylon in Rome, about 1,500 miles away from Turkey, where he's writing to here, it's about A.D. 62. Tertullian speaks of Peter's ministry in Rome in glowing terms. How happy is a church on which the apostles pour forth all their doctrine. Peter was passionate, enthusiastic, responsible and committed to his ministry in the church in Rome. He worked hard on building up the believers in that city. But he also cared for and ministered to believers who were distant from him. He pens this letter to encourage them in the faith and obedience and sends them this faithful messenger, Silas. None of that will directly help his ministry in Rome. It's time and effort and energy spent on Christians outside of his congregation. But it's a ministry for the kingdom, a ministry for his Lord. Despite the last point, Here's a Scottish illustration for you. John Knox, when he was out in Geneva, an assistant to, to John Calvin, uh, caring for people, he took the service in, in English. Uh, could you imagine trying to listen to, to, to John Knox uh, uh, speaking in English? But, but he, when he was there, wrote letters to the Scottish gentry uh, who were being opposed for their reforms within the church. Though he was in, in Geneva, ministering there, his hands full of ministry, yet... He had time and interest and passion to write to others. And we too are to have a mission interest, a care for the work of Christ beyond this congregation. And we too are to try and help in some way. We pray for Mark. We pray for Hannah. What can we do more? I heard this week uh, uh, from Andrew uh, about Sashko uh, uh, out in uh, Ukraine translating the Reformation Study Bible into the Polish language. What a project this is, and we can pray for that, but can we do more? Peter prayed for these believers in Turkey, but he did more. He wrote to them this deeply encouraging letter. 
Sixthly, be willing to minister outside your comfort zone. Peter was appointed by the Lord uh, to, and the church uh, to be the minister of the Jews, Galatians 2, 7. He was a Jew. He understood the Jews, the mindset, the laws, the customs of the Jews. That was his main focus and interest. That was where he was comfortable with, ministering and teaching the Jews. But this letter is predominantly to Gentiles. The phrase we read in chapter 1, verse 18, your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. Chapter 2, verse 10, who once were not a people. Chapter 4, verse 3, we have spent enough of our past lifetime doing the will of the Gentiles. All of these phrases indicate that he was writing primarily to Gentiles. This was not his comfort zone not his bread and butter ministry, but he heard of their need and he determined to meet their need. Let us be willing to minister outside of our comfort zone. Types of people are fascinating, aren't they? The yellow bubbly type, the red angry type, the green developing type, the blue cool type. And sometimes we need to change color the angry to be cool, the cool to be bubbly, to go outside of what we are comfortable with. Some people try to do everything and fail miserably. Some people do everything and, and, and complain about doing everything. Other people say, that's not my job. Even when there's great need. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. This was his area, his patch, his parish, the Apostle Paul. He's not mentioned in this letter, so he might be absent from Rome. He might be away, missionary work in Spain. But the churches in Turkey had a need. And Peter was there in Rome, his hands full of ministry, his main focus being the Jews, and yet he went out of his comfort zone. And he writes to the Gentiles. Maybe you're a baker. Your 40 is leaving a bag of freshly baked scones on the door handle of a shut-in. Maybe there's some other ministry that God's asking you to do. Maybe you're a pen pusher. Sometimes you might be willing to stack the chairs in the church hall. Lastly, let's remember our place in redemptive history. Throughout this book, as we'll see, and as we've already seen, Peter keeps connecting the history of the New Testament believers here to the Old Testament church. His main thesis is that these believers he's writing to now are now God's people. They're the chosen. They're the witnesses. They're the called. He gives us the image of the church as being a building connected to one another. And that connection is throughout the ages, the believing in all ages, being together, the temple and place of God. What a wonderful thing it is for us as a congregation to recognize our connections to God's people over the centuries and our connections to God's people currently throughout the earth. As we read and hear of mission work, the church growing and persecuted throughout the, the earth. We recognize our connection to other believers. And so, as we come to the end of this year, look to a new year, we can use these seven ways in which Peter is an example to us to review our life and perhaps to make some adjustment. But if you're here and you're not yet a Christian, consider this, that you are at home in this world. This world, this life of yours now is your home. This is all you have. This is the best that you have. This is the best that your existence will ever be. Because what waits for you after death is awful unspeakable and eternal judgment. You need to change that by God's grace. 
what you need to do is have a new home. A home not here, but a home in heaven. For that to look forward to after this life, as you repent of your sins, as you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross for the sin of the world, you will be forgiven and you by God's grace will have a home certain, sure, glorious in the presence of God forever and ever. 